see what happens here. Sounds good. Hopefully it works. You never know. We're um, going to wing it. Yeah. <laughs> It, uh, it looks like we're up and running. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I see us on this screen. I see us on the Facebook screen. <laughs> um, I don't know what else I can do to confirm that it's working, but uh, it looks like we're good to go. So uh, it is the third Monday of the month, which means we are back with uh, another Parents Helping Parents live stream uh, where we bring together a parent from the community we bring together a professional from the community, and then I do my best to rodeo them into a good conversation uh, for your viewing and listening pleasure. So uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Derek. Hey, before we get started, um, hopefully she's okay with this, but I did read uh, on Facebook today that it's our executive director, Becky's birthday. Uh, right. So uh, big shout out uh, to right. Becky. Happy birthday. Hopefully you're enjoying it not watching us uh, on this, but doing something fun for your birthday. You can watch us later, Becky. Uh, but uh, but big happy birthday to you, Becky. We love uh, everything you do for us at Parents Helping Parents. So uh, if you're new to our live streams, uh, this is our virtual chapter, our live stream, something we do to kind of connect with a broader audience. But I want to encourage you uh, to go to parentshelpingparents.info for more information about the organization. I'll touch on that in a second. So if you're watching this live, go ahead and do me a favor, uh, reach up, click the like button, click the share button to share our content on your newsfeed. It exponentially increases the number of parents that can hear the message. Uh, and what I tell people is we, uh, our problems do a couple of things to us. One of the things they do to us is they lie to us. They tell us that we're the only ones that are dealing with that particular issue. So you actually never know uh, how many people you're Facebook friends with that are potentially struggling with addiction, struggling with mental health, or have a family member that's struggling. And by sharing this stream on your Facebook page, uh, what you're doing is you're putting them in touch with a message of hope uh, that they might need to desperately hear. So uh, go ahead and hit that share button. You could do it periodically throughout the evening if you want and reshare it. That'd be great. So um, Welcome back, everybody. We love that we can do this virtual chapter, but I want to encourage people uh, of a couple of things. As good as this, uh, this live stream is and as good as it is to connect with people and hear the message, there's nothing more powerful than being in a room of other parents who are offering genuine support for you, or in our case, being in a Zoom room of lots of different parents who are offering support while we're taking COVID precautions. So uh, Parents Helping Parents does have chapters in several different locations in several different cities that are currently operating uh, through Zoom. But uh, hopefully, me and Bill were just talking about this with vaccines and everything else, we'll be uh, normalizing back to in-person meetings soon, fingers crossed. Um, whenever we can do that safely. But for more information about our chapters, for everything we're up to, go to the web, parentshelpingparents.info and check out our newly beautiful redesigned website that Bill actually had a hand in creating, I think. Um, so other than that, I guess the only other thing you need to know is that Parents Helping Parents is an organization uh, created by parents, for the most part run by parents, and their goal is to provide education support uh, and shared experiences with parents who have a young person any age who might be struggling with a substance use disorder. So as an organization, Parents Helping Parents has no professional expertise. Uh, nothing that we do, events we host, should ever be considered a substitute for professional counseling, legal advice, medical advice, any of those things. All those things are great. We recommend you get those if it's appropriate for you. Uh, but our role is simply sharing our experiences, connecting you with resources and providing some education. So luckily we do have a professional joining us for the live stream tonight. So um, she can be on the hook for all the professional things <laughs> she says. Um, that's why we've got all got malpractice insurance and things like that. True that. So, yeah. um, hey, what I wanna do is just uh, let Bill and Amy introduce yourselves. Uh, Bill, if you're okay, we'll start with Amy, ladies first. Sure. Um, Amy, so just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and um, we'll kind of go from there. Well, my name is Amy Morrison. I am a, a licensed alcohol, drug, and mental health counselor. I've been in the field. This is year 20, but I'm about 25, so I got into it when I was about five years old. <laughs> just um, it's, an early, it's an early start. 
Mm. I know. I was like Sheldon Cooper, a super, super overachiever. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I have a master's in addiction counseling and a master's in professional counseling and um, was raised among multiple um, addicts, alcoholics. Um, I'm the wife, sister, daughter, granddaughter, niece, cousin of multiple addicts. And so um, in addition to my own journey, <clears throat> I've most definitely been part of the family and the loved ones of addicts and um, absolutely love what I do. Um, I'm a really good co-addict or codependent. If you put me in a room with 50 people, I'm going to find the one that's struggling with something because we're drawn to one another. Um, but that's, that's great with me. That's my um, chosen demographic. So I love, love, love what I do. And I love to help people recognize <clears throat> that addiction is not a parenting failure. It's a disease. So. Yeah, very good. Amy, thanks for joining us. Looking forward to visiting with you. Mr. Bill. Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Guy. I am a uh, husband and a father and uh, a grandfather and um, native Oklahoman. Um, I have been um, doing, I've, I'm on the board of directors for Parents Helping Parents. I've, I've been working with parents, help, volunteering with Parents Helping Parents for about four years, I think. Um, and I also uh, am a, peer parent, a trained peer parent coach with the Partnership to End Addiction. It used to be called the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, but um, now it's the Partnership to End Addiction. Um, and I, I hope to tell you a little bit more uh, about that. Um, our, uh, uh, like Amy, I, I come from a family. I don't really, I, I'm sure because, you know, <laughs> our, 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 all of our family were farmers and so they all had a lot of kids. And so my grandfather had 14 brothers and sisters and my wow. dad had eight brothers and sisters. Um, and of course, there's a lot of grandkids and everything. I don't know of any um any drug use but but we have 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 had a lot of alcohol is alcoholism in our family going back several generations our son was the um was my youngest son was the was our loved one who was using substances um i, I didn't really uh find out for sure you know it's kind of it's been a while ago um and and it's kind of you know, sometimes it's kind of hard for me to realize I'm in denial today, but to think back, you know, 20 years ago as to uh, how much of it was, was my own fault because I was in denial, but I didn't really find out that Chris was, had a very serious problem with drugs until after he had graduated from high school. And then, and then he went through about, uh, about 15 years, 15, 16 years of absolute hell. And uh, so did we. And uh, he unfortunately lost his struggle um, four years ago in September at the age of 34. And I had gotten enough involved with groups like Al-Anon and, and then with parents helping parents that I had, thankfully, I had begun to work on my program, work on getting myself well. Um, and, uh, and so I had determined even before Chris passed that the struggle that he had and the struggle that we had with him and the things that I had learned that really saved my life that, uh, you know, I came to the place where I realized that Chris was either going to get well or he was going to get in trouble and get in jail or he was going to be injured and uh, in any number of ways that he could have been injured or that he could overdose. And I had, that was part of my journey is I had to, I had to get myself to that place. And uh, that doesn't mean that we weren't devastated when it happened, but at least I had done some groundwork and I knew that I really didn't have any control over that. And I had determined that he had gone through so much and we had gone through so much that if I had learned anything that would help somebody else that was going through that, that I needed to do that. And then 
after he died, um, that resolve was is even stronger in me um, because I don't want this to happen to other people. Yeah. Bill, um, one, thank you so much for just being vulnerable uh, to share your story and talk about um, your history and your grief. That's not an easy thing to do. And then two, obviously, um, I, I'm sorry for the loss of your family member to the disease. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, it's a story that's way too common. Right. Um, and, and especially even more so during, during COVID. Yeah. So thinking about Amy and Bill, um, you know, your own histories. I know Amy, you're, you're a professional, but it sounds like you've got um, a lot of personal experience with the things that we're talking about too. One of the things that a lot of our families struggle with is how do they find support for what they're going through? So what would you guys each suggest in terms of the most effective and the easiest ways for parents to find support just so that they feel like they can keep it together? Mm -hmm. Amy, do you want to jump in first? Sure. Um, I can't, I, I have an 18 year old and a 20 year old um, who have been raised watching their dad go to meetings every week, several times a week. And, and we were in the grocery store one day and Kristen was probably two, my oldest. <clears throat> and I'm loading the stuff up on the belt. And he goes, my dad went to jail. And this lady behind me <laughs> turns around and, and I go, yeah. And he goes, alcohol. And that was true. And he goes, but he goes to meetings now. Like it, it's just been part of our um, environment and our upbringing of them. He asked, one of them asked very early, how do you tell dad if you're an alcoholic? And, and his dad said, unfortunately, that's the problem. You don't know till you are until it's too late. <clears throat> so they've always known and been very, very cautious because it's been organically instilled in them. Like from birth, they knew. Um, as far as how to feel less alone in this um, family disease, because it is, it's, it's, it's whenever I was, I was kind of taking notes, Bill, when you were sharing about Chris, and my, I'm, I'm my deepest sympathy. Um, I've lost a child, never want to have that in common with anyone right. to watch somebody um, have limitless potential and, and not be able to come out on the other side. Um, healthy is, is horrific. Um, and I apologize. Um, but um, I was taking notes and I was kind of thinking, you know, if loving somebody was enough to keep them clean or sober, we wouldn't be here because right. they're loved. They're, 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 they don't love themselves. But as far as feeling less alone, <clears throat> there's still, even now, such a stigma associated with addiction. And when I say addiction, I, I'm in, um, including alcohol and any other drug. So just for simplicity's right. sake, I'll say addiction. Um, but, but that's even just for someone who's just, just a drinker. Um, but it's, there's such a, my, uh, my family, when I, when I married, my husband would, would whisper that he had a problem. Mm. And one day at lunch, my husband said, I'm an alcoholic, Sandy, just and in like forks were half and they just stopped. And he was like, you don't have to whisper. It's okay. And so he kind of inspired them to get better acquainted with it. But there is such a, a, a shame factor associated with it. People are ignorant with regard to the disease concept. They're ignorant with regard to the fact that if there was something to try to help your child, your brother, your sister, your, your mom, it's been tried 15 times. We've all tried. It's, it's not something that we can do for them or it would be done. We wouldn't be yeah. here. So I think a lot of it is situations like this, where people, instead of waiting for someone to reach out to me, I will reference something simply just in case I'm the only, it's kind of cliche maybe, but if I'm the only copy of the big book that you see, that's okay. Right. If I can get you to recognize you are not alone. Right. 
and you don't have to stay alone. You don't have to feel alone because you're not alone, but you can come out of hiding and, and understand that this is not a failure with regard to a, a moral compass or parenting or your family dynamic. This is um, in spite of those things. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's all so good, Amy. Thank you so much. You know, um, it, it, we were, you know, there was some stigma involved um, to an extent, but, you know, f but really with us, it was more, especially with family and friends, you know, they would, you know, they, after a while, they knew that Chris was having problems and we'd get together and they'd say things like, how's Chris doing? You know, and, and I would most normally I would say something like, you know, we're just working at it one day at a time. The alternative would have been, well, you know, we're all here to eat Thanksgiving dinner, but if you want to go upstairs, spend about four hours with me, <laughs> you know, oh. it, it's, um, and that was one of the things when I, when I discovered Al-Anon, uh, and, and first went into, to an Al-Anon meeting, it was like, oh my gosh. All these guys, and, and I went primarily to a, a, a men's meeting that, you know, there are co-ed meetings, there are meetings for men, there are meetings for women. I, I ended up, because it really, it was close to my work, and um, and it was at noon, so I could take my lunch shower and go, but it was just like, oh my gosh, these people, these guys, uh, they're like me, and they're having the same kind of problems that I have, and I'm not the only one. And they're they're working, you know, they're, you know, they're at various levels of working their programs, but they're getting better, you know. And they, you know, I don't have to try to explain to them something that you can't explain unless you've gone through it, you know. So I would really, if uh, you know, I would really say, you know, Derek, one one real thing. And of course, now in COVID, there's not that many meetings in person, but there are there are a lot of Al-Anon meetings that are available online. And I would say, you know, and I know some people get hung up on uh, it is a spiritual program, but it's not heavy handed spiritual. Your higher power can be a positive energy if that's all you want it to be, you know. And I also tell people, you know, Al Anon meetings are kind of like churches. You know, sometimes you go to a church and it's a fit and people are friendly and, the, you know, the message is positive and you feel like you're getting something out of it. Spiritual and program, but go it's to another not place. Heavy handed. Or, you can go to another place and it doesn't have a fit. So I, I would tell you to shop around. Right. Uh, you know, these meetings like we're doing here, I don't know if everyone who's watching this meeting is aware, but Parents Helping Parents has chapters in Norman, in Edmond, in Oklahoma City, in Tulsa. We have a kind of a fledgling chapter um, in Wichita. And they also are having, uh, especially the Tulsa and the Edmond and the Norman chapters are having two online meetings a month. So if you go to parentshelpingparents.info, and I'll put that in the chat a little bit later, but it's parentshelpingparents.info, you can go up to the tab that says, uh, you know, chapters, and then you can find out what nights of the month they meet, what's the time, uh, you know, kind of what the topic is going to be. I referenced the partnership to end addiction, uh, you know, that the, the most people will probably remember, you know, back, it may have been even the, in the 80s, that there was a big ad campaign where they would put, you know, they would break a couple of eggs into a frying pan, and they'd say, this is your brain, and then they'd scramble the eggs, and they'd say, this is your brain on drugs. And um, that's the partnership. And, and for many, many years, their primary emphasis was on prevention, which is important. But then when the opioid crisis really hit, you know, in the early 2000s and people just started by, dying by the hundreds and thousands, the partnership realized that they really, uh, they really needed to provide some, some support uh, for people who were going through that. And so the partnership's uh, website is drugfree.org, D-R-U-G-F-R-E-E.org. And I'm telling you, there are there is an abundance of resources on that website. You can go to that website and you can put in the search engine meth and you'll go to a whole section on meth and what the signs are and the behaviors. And, um, 
and then uh, so there's a lot of information that's that's just there on the website that you can download. There's some really good links to some other places. Um, but one of the one of the really good things about the partnership is that they offer a a, a free peer parent coach program, and wow. people like myself, we've gone through an intensive weekend training, and then we do online. Um, and, and other kinds of kind of, I guess you would say, professional development, you know, to sort of keep up with things. But if you go to that website, there will be something on the website that will say, uh, you know, I need help or I need support or whatever. And then if you uh, there's a toll free number and if you call that number, you'll have a, you'll have someone who um, is a professional, uh, you know, like the guy I help facilitate um, a, a group coaching session for parents every other Saturday morning. And Jack, the guy that uh, helps me co-facilitate that is a licensed family counselor. So when you call that helpline, you're going to be talking to a professional and they will talk to you you know, probably for about an hour and kind of find out what your situation is and what you're going through. And they, you know, they, one of the things that they want to try to find out is if it's in a crisis situation, because it's, if it's actually at a crisis situation, there may be other professionals that, you know, need to be contacted. But if it's just someone who is like I was and at my wits end and didn't know what to do, um, then they match you with someone who has been trained like me and you have a series of about five or six um, around hour long talks for about five once a week for about five or six weeks and there's a curriculum that we use that's uh, based on a book called Beyond Addiction and I'll put the information about that in the chat room too but it's just um, it's just a really good free service to give people a lifeline and help them better understand what they're dealing with that as Amy said that you know it's not that their kids just being a little brat it, it if they've been using for any while it's taken over the synapses in their brain and their brain's telling them you do this or you're going to die and we know that that if they do that, they may die too, you know? So it helps people understand what the problem, kind of the nature of the problem that they're dealing with. Talks a lot about self-care. I'm telling you, you know, it's a cliche, but when we, when we, back when we could fly and we got on that airplane, they would, the, they would say, you know, when the oxygen mask drops down, you need to put that thing on yourself because if you're struggling for air, you can't save your child or your grandma or anybody else. And I'm telling you, it is the absolute truth. You know, when I finally decided to get help, it was because I had gone through a major depression and then I started having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. Well, no wonder I wasn't in a position to try to help Chris. And of course, you know, uh, there's certain kinds of help that you can give. You're not gonna be able to make them do anything. But if you're, if you're strung out like I was, I needed help. I wasn't in a position to help anybody. And so they kind of, there's some, some really good information and resources and, and suggestions on how to get yourself well and, 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 and be in a better position to be able to help somebody. And then there's some really good uh, information on how to communicate better with your using loved one, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, if I, you know, I, I need to lose some weight. And if my wife was coming in at me every day and saying, why are you eating a piece of cake? Can't you see that you're growing out of your pants? You know, that's probably not going to be conducive to me to say, oh, oh, you're right, honey. I'll just not eat cake anymore, you know. Yeah. But, Sometimes you'd eat more cake. Yeah, that's right. But <laughs> you know, so it's, it's how to communicate with your child in a loving way so that it, uh, it has an opportunity to increase communication rather than shut it down. And yeah. then there's some, a little bit about boundaries, you know, what is a boundary, when, why you should set a boundary, you know, I was confused for so many years thinking that a boundary was about punishing Chris, you know, I thought it was about, I thought the boundary was about Chris, the boundaries aren't about Chris, the boundaries are about what I can deal with, and so, you know, um, it's like, these are the things that I need to put in place in my house so that I and the other family members feel comfortable and safe living here. Yeah. And if that means that you can't come in at three o'clock in the morning, then, you know, then you'll have to 
find a place to stay, you know, yeah. and, you know, but I didn't know all that. And so anyway, I, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful resource. And, um, and I would really recommend that you, that you reach out to that. And Bill, I, I shared all those links in the Facebook chat for good, you. Good, um, thank you. Amy, from a, just kind of from a clinical perspective, without healthy support, mm. how hard is it for parents to remain healthy themselves when they have a loved one struggling? And how hard is it for parents to learn how to manage boundaries if they're out here on an island trying to do it on their own? Well, <clears throat> when you sit with family members and, and their, their, um, their loved one, their child who is combating addiction and you ask them, what have you been doing thus far? And they'll say, yeah. whatever, that whatever their list of strategy has been. And then you ask them, how's that working out? I mean, not to be like super sarcastic about it, but their best thinking landed them where they are, whether it be yeah. an individual counseling, residential treatment, um, you know, family and marital, whatever, wherever they are. Um, and so a lot of times I, I really do feel like one of the biggest barriers is the, the, <clears throat> the concern, like what will people think? I have a very good friend whose son struggled immensely and actually lost his life a couple of years ago um, in Chicago all by himself, knew nobody there and OD'd in a hotel room. But, but the point is, um, I think she struggled with worrying about what people were going to think. And, and that, that's, again, why the resources that Bill just spoke about, al on all those things, th this kind of forum allows them to feel less alone. Mm -hmm. but, but ultimately, I mean, when it comes to our children, we would give our lives to, to save them from cancer. We would give our lives to save, but, but we don't recognize the cunning, baffling, and powerful part that we're giving our lives with regard to their addiction, Absolutely. but it's, it's not as blatantly obvious because it's, it's like silent killers, like, like stress, anxiety, he's developing panic attacks for the first time in his life, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it really does become about the sense of community and fellowship. I mean, there's a reason the 12 steps work. It's not the only way there are people who get clean and sober other ways and don't don't partake with that regard but there isn't an, there isn't a human being on this earth in my opinion that wouldn't benefit from the 12 step absolutely and, it, and the the um there's still i ran into someone once not very long ago that that asked if it was a cult and i was i really i i almost i was like what um i i i I still can't believe in 2021 that that's even um, a concern, but it is, and I get it. And I'm totally fine with explaining it instead of, you know, being aghast and walking away from that. But I just really think that if the, he's absolutely right, if you can't breathe, you can't help somebody else breathe. You can't pour from an empty cup, whatever metaphor you want to use. And, and part of it is as parents, we get stuck in that, um, well, I can't take my happiness off the top. In fact, quite frankly, I was raised by a woman who said, um, nobody wins when you, when you, the parent, takes your happiness off the top. And I was like, so the first time self-care came up as a new mom, I wrestled with that. And I'm in the field and I still was like, I deserve to go get a manicure or whatever it was. Yeah. But I had to talk myself through that. Fast forward to self-care when your child is actively addicted, it has to be astronomically difficult to, to navigate that. And when you have friends, you've got Bill sitting there on a Zoom or you're sitting in an Al-Anon meeting with me or, or whatever, and you can turn and someone's going to go, go get your nails done or take the hot shower, go play golf, go to see a movie, read your book, lock the door and read your book, whatever. Um, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's vitally important on a good day, but when you add to it, those silent stressors that take so much from us, mm -hmm. the anxiety, the worry, someone asked me one time, why do you choose to worry so much? And I was like, I don't choose to worry. 
who chooses to worry? She's like, no, you, you're choosing to worry. And so I had to kind of reflect on that for a, a good, well, I was mad first about it, that she had said that. And I was like, of course I didn't choose. But I was raised in a worrying environment. My mother worried about everything constantly. So it was a learned behavior for sure. And then I figured out as long as I worried that I felt like it was up there in God's ear reminding him what I needed. Don't mm. forget, I need this. Don't forget, I need you to keep Chris safe. Don't forget, I need you to da, 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 da. And it wasn't working. <laughs> it didn't change the outcome. Yeah. It just made me sick. Right. But we have to learn to give ourselves permission to let that part go. We can take it back anytime we want, but surrender is a journey, not a destination. So you, so you, through the time and your experience and watching other people do it, you learn, hey, I don't have to do it that way. Right. Just because it's been that way for five generations of my family, I don't have to do that. I can be the change that I want to see in this family. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. We had a we had a question that somebody asked on Facebook and and I answered it in a in a chat, but I'd really like to hear um how you each would answer it. Um I'm gonna paraphrase it, but um essentially is, is getting support from parents helping parents or Al-Anon or any, you know, fill in the blank support group. Is it still worth it? Even if you feel like you're past the point about caring because the struggle's just gone on too long with your loved ones. Well, I, yeah, I would say because, you know, well, I would just say for myself, if, if I, and, and I'm telling you, there were times, you know, there were times that, I, that you do feel like, well, what's the use, you know, what, what, what is the use, you know, uh, so it's not an uncommon feeling, but, you know, I, I would go back to what I said earlier, that going to the meetings, it, it, it's not that the purpose is not to help your using loved one, because obviously it is. But, but the way that you help your loved one is that you helping yourself, well yourself, you know, you get well yourself and, you know, you're going to have a life, whether your son gets, whether your child gets well or not, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're still going to have a life. And if you don't start working on building a life for yourself, cause I, I'm going to tell you, you know, you, it, it can just suck the life out of you where you don't want to do anything, you know, and, you know, uh, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't live that way. You know, we, um, uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, about myself with, with Chris was he started, I now know that he started using at least in some way when he was about 13, 14 years old, we knew he was troubled as a kid, you know, he would, get into a few scrapes not anything major you know but he he seemed moody you know he seemed you know troubled about things well I'm sorry you know what 13 14 15 year old kid isn't troubled at some time you know and if they're not doing something that's just blatant you know then it it does take you a while to figure out what's going on but you know I I uh, I just felt um you know with him that um you know, once then I finally did, you know, figure out um, it, it saved my life. You know, it, it saved my life. And, you know, we, we, a parent has a connection with the kid that nobody else has. And I don't care how bad it is now. I mean, you, you know, I, I can understand. Uh, it, it's like caring hurts. You know, I can understand, uh, you know, where you're coming from. But I just say, try to think about getting self-care for you. You know, try to think about getting self-care for you because it's going to help you. And then in addition to that, it's going to help you be in a better place. You know, you ne don't ever give hope. Don't ever give up hope. I have a cousin whose husband is 65 years old. He started drinking when he was 14 years old. Last summer, he was he had gotten so bad that his son... I think put him in the car and took him to the doctor and he didn't know where they were going. <laughs> and he saw a doctor and the doctor examined him and he said, you know, he said, how much, when did you start drinking? He said, when I was 14 years old, 
He said, how much are you drinking now? He said about a fifth a day. Mm. And he said, I'm going to tell you, he said, you're, you know, it's obviously that you work out and that you, you know, you've kept, you've tried to keep yourself physically healthy and it hasn't caught, I'm, it's just a miracle almost that it hasn't caught up with you by now. But he said, I'm going to tell you, if you don't do something, you're either going to be dead in a year or two, or you're going to be, uh, you're not, you're going to be in a home and you're not going to have any mind. And I guess that scared him, you know, and he went through a 90 day program and he's still doing okay at 65 years old, the first time he ever went into recovery. So I know it's hard to hold on to that hope, but don't ever give up hope and you work getting yourself better so that, you know, when something happens that, you know, causes your loved one to think maybe about getting help, you'll, you'll be in a better shape. And, you know, if they don't, then you'll still be in a better shape to be have a life yourself and for your other family members. Agree. Yep. You know, I was listening to you thinking it takes what it takes. You know, it took, it took the doctor saying, gosh, dude, you, mm -hmm. you need to, you, mm -hmm. you're going to have wet brain if you don't stop, or if you live, you're going to end up um, unable to function um, the way that you want to. Um, my husband will be clean, God willing, 20. He was clean 22 years in July. Mm. Um, he got clean when he was 23, 24, 22, sorry, 22. He had open heart surgery, two strokes, three DUIs, stole from everyone he knew, was homeless, took cold showers one entire winter because he wouldn't pay the gas bill and take from his drug and alcohol money to do it. So he took cold showers all winter, um, was violent, was abusive, was racked with guilt, shame, self-loathing. Oh. And he finally reached out and got help because he got embarrassed at work. It takes what it takes. Yeah. You never know what it's gonna take. Right. And <clears throat> I, 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 I don't know the exact situation, but I can tell you that my first thought when, when Derek read what he did about, you know, why now or whatever was, well, cause you deserve it. Yep. You deserve the support. You deserve the insight. You deserve to set boundaries and mean it mm -hmm. and know that it's not to punish them, but to, to love yourself. And as a mom, it, did, it was a female, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. As a mother, um, if you're raising, you want, we also kind of forget, you remember the commercial years and years ago, the dad finds, um, I think it's like a cigar box of drugs and, and he goes to his son and he goes, where did you learn this? Where did you learn this? And the kid finally looks at him and says, I learned it from watching you mm -hmm. and, and the kids and the dad's like, well, like devastated that the kid, his son was aware Mm -hmm. they watch us uh, if we drink they watch us if we use drugs and they watch us if we practice self-care right. so when you take care of yourself as the parent of an addict you are sending the message that it's okay to reach out ask for help and get well right, right. you're modeling healthy behavior even yes. though it feels yes. like a guilt-ridden thing, you're modeling healthy behavior for your child, <clears throat> for the neighbor whose daughter is a closet drinker and she doesn't tell anybody. Right. You're showing people that it's okay to love yourself. <clears throat> it's not selfish. It's yeah. selfless. Yes. Yeah, that's so true. You know, there are a couple of things that I want to share. Uh, I was thinking about the things, the points that I wanted to make, and, and here's one of them. <clears throat> you know, when, when, when I finally figured out that Chris really did have a problem, I just thought, you know, I, we've got to find a place and get him into treatment. And if we can get him into treatment and it's a good place that he will get well, and we'll put this thing behind us, you know? Neat little package. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I don't want to be, I want to be the voice of encouragement and not the voice of discouragement. But if you've got a kid that's, that's got a problem with alcohol or a problem with drugs, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's over, it's not a, a sprint. It is yeah. a marathon. 
And it, it, you know, the, the average person goes, I've heard this, that the average person who is really addicted, you know, they may be in treatment program six or eight times before it, for one works, but then they may, it may work the first time, you know, but we don't know. And so that's another reason to take care of yourself is because you gotta, you gotta, it's just like, you know, if you're going to run a marathon, um, you know, you, don't, you just don't get on the, you don't, you just don't go out there and start running, you know, uh, the day of the race, you've got to do your diet, you've got to do exercises, you've got to do mental preparation for that. And, you know, there's going to be some stumbles, you know, you're, you're going to pull, you're going to, you're going to pull an Achilles tendon, or you're going to fall and, cramp. and, and yep, hurt yep, yourself yep. or whatever, yep. you know, that's, that was the other point that I wanted to make is that, you know, we, um, you know, we're well aware that our, our loved one, uh, it, it comes in fits and starts and, you know, they may make a little bit of pre progress and then they fall flat on their face. We're going to do that too. You know, we, we, we set up unreasonable expectations for ourselves. And instead of, you know, when they, you know, when they make a mistake, it, it, it can be a tendency to think, oh my God, they were doing so well. And now they've done, they've used again. And now everything that we've done is gone. Don't look at it that way. Look at it. Look at, man, if they were clean for three months, you know that they can be clean for three months. And look at it that this use was an opportunity, a growth opportunity for them and for you, because they can get right back on the horse and ride again. And it's the same way with us in our self-care. It's like, you know, I've been working on trying to communicate, you know, well with Chris and I've been working on this thing, and then he steals his his daughter's uh, laptop uh, that was going to be her Christmas present, you know, for Christmas, and and then I blow up about that, you know. It's like, God, you know, can you, you know? And then it's then it would be real easy for me at that point to say, you know, all that work that I've been putting into this and trying to communicate with him and doing better, and now it's all for crap, Nothing. you know. Yeah. But you, you just can't look, you know, it, it, it doesn't help anyone to look at it that way. It's just like, you know, yeah, I, I, I lost my temper. I, I blew up, but there's such a thing as an apology. And, and it's, it's not about the mistakes. It's about the day to day work and grind and trying to do it right. That's going to get you there. Agree. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you guys are, I mean, right on point. Um, in terms of, you know, this is support is about you, yeah, not your loved one, right? Yeah. And that's a starting point, right? Um, whether whether that's Excuse a starting me. point for our own health and wellness, or that's a starting point for someone's catalyst to change, yeah, um, it really doesn't matter. Like we gotta we gotta do it for us first, yeah. And then, and then see what happens. So. You know, I want to, Derek, I want to talk just a few minutes about change. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard of a guy named James Prochaska, P-R-O-C-H-I-S-K-A. He's written a seminal book about change, the stages of change. And, you know, that is like I said, you know, I just thought, you know, if we could just get Chris into a treatment program, that everything's going to be hunky-dory. Well, you know, if we're going to make a change about any, anything, there are stages of that change. And the first stage is called pre-contemplation. You're not even really thinking about, you know, it's like, I don't have a problem. Well, I, I've smelled it. You know, I, I smelled my, my, you know, I was with some friends and, you know, they smoked in the car. Now it's on my jacket. I don't have a problem. You know, I, I don't need help. You know, I'm not, you're not even thinking about getting help is pre-contemplation. Then something happens, uh, like you said, um, your husband at work, Amy, says, you know, someone, it was an embarrassing thing at work. Something happens, and it's like, God, you know, I, I, I know I need to do something. I don't think I can do it. I just don't think I can do it, but I know I need to do something. But at least you're beginning to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then if you can continue to get support, and this is for us too, this is for us too. These, the, we go through these same, cha the same changes. You know, you may be listening tonight and you may be thinking, 
oh, they're going on about that al not again. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I don't know if they, I, I don't know. That just doesn't sound like something that would be good for me. But, you know, then, you know, they get arrested again. And then it's like, oh, God, I've got to do something. So, you know, it's like, well, you know, I guess I could go to one of those meetings, you know. But then if you take it seriously enough that, that you go to the computer and you do a search and you see where the meetings are, that's the preparation stage. You know, you're, and it's like, well, okay, that one meets on Wednesday. I've been doing this on Wednesday, but maybe I can, you know, I walk with Susie on Wednesday. Maybe Susie can walk on Tuesday. So you're preparing for that to happen. And then when you actually go to the meeting, that's the action stage. You know, you're doing something. And then if, you know, if you stay in there and it's the same thing like our kids, if they stay in there, and like you said, your husband, he's in recovery right now. Uh, he's, at the, he's at the point where, where, you know, there's no guarantee that he's not going to go out tomorrow night and no. take a drink. But he's maintaining. Right now, he's maintaining. And the thing about those stages, it's kind of like the stages of grief. They, they're interchangeable. You know, you can be at the action stage and someone says something in an Al-Anon meeting that pisses you off. And it's like you've bumped that back down to the, you know, I, I don't think I'll go to that anymore. You know, yeah. I mean, it's very fluid, but I think it really helped me to to understand that, you know, me thinking that I was when I found out that Chris was in a real serious problem and that we were going to, you know, the first two rehabs that he went to were things that I engineered for him and neither one of them worked. But it's because he hadn't he he didn't own it himself. He didn't move from, from the, within himself from being at a place where it's like, I don't have a problem. I, there's nothing wrong with me to the stage of, yeah, you know, if I don't, if I don't do something, I'm going to go to jail. You know, I better think, you know, it, 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 it helped me when I understood that it, it it's a project <laughs> and it's a long haul project, but yeah. there are stages through it. And if you can understand what those stages are, that can, it can kind of help you understand what you need to do to, to move to the next stage and also how you might help your kid move to the next stage. Yeah. yeah. I, can I say one, I was, I was sitting there thinking about this and I, I remember the, the first time, I don't know about anybody else in the room, but asking for help is really hard for me. <clears throat> I struggle with perfectionism. I compare if I'm taking notes randomly, just here, there and everywhere, but, but Derek's taking copious notes and writing everything down. I'm thinking, Oh, he's going to get more out of this than I am. Just that first thought wrong stuff about I, I'm not doing it right, or I'm not doing it well enough, or I'm not doing it th to the best of my ability. So that, that inner, that, that stuff in my head from growing up the way that I did, whatever, that's my explanation, not my excuse. <clears throat> but learning to ask for help is part of this um, journey too. And this is how I convince myself to ask for help. Uh, just a little tip. Every time I ask for help in the program with a colleague, if I, if I texted Derek next week and said, I, I need to make a referral to Oklahoma City and I don't know exactly which area to look to, can you help me? Okay. Every time we ask for help, we, um, we create an opportunity for somebody else to learn and grow. Absolutely. By sharing their own knowledge and their experience, strength and hope. <clears throat> if next week I find out my son has um, a drug problem, God, God help us. But, but God forbid if that happened and I called Bill and said, okay, I'm where you were 10 yeah. years ago, what do yeah. I do? Yeah. Bill gets to grow with me. Yes. So when I couldn't ask for help for me, cause I didn't love me enough to do it. Yeah. I could ask for help. If it meant I might be helping bill. Like I had to trick Ooh. myself Absolutely. into, I'm not being a burden to him. Right. He's not judging me. He gets it. Cause he's been there. Yes. And I know I'm not the only person that feels this way, Amy. Uh, but I, you know, I know a lot of other peer parent coaches and it is such an honor when someone yes. asks us for help it's just like 
and you know, in, in, in the work that I'm doing, I feel like that when I do, like tonight, what I'm doing tonight, it honors Chris. It makes, yes. it gives meaning to his struggle. It even gives meaning to his death, yes. you know? And, and so you're exactly right. Yeah, man. Thank you guys so much for everything that you're sharing. I want to wrap up with a couple of um, kind of easy softball questions, really. Um, Amy, uh, tell people like where you practice and maybe how to get in touch with you. If anybody watches and says, hey, I want to talk more to this lady, uh, maybe in a professional setting, just take an opportunity to put your stuff out there for anybody who might be interested. Um, I um, have a private practice in Cushing. I'm in Cushing where I live. And right now we're pretty much doing Zoom sessions only for the sake of COVID precautions. Sure. Um, <clears throat> but um, I have a private practice here in Cushing and uh, it's called Journey to Truth Counseling. And it's, I'm it, I'm the whole practice, but um, for the sake of having a name. And then I also um, am contracted with um, Crossroads Counseling in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And they have a wide variety of um, different clinicians. <clears throat> um, in addition to LADCs, LADCMH, there are LPCs, LMFTs, there are doulas. There is a, a focus on maternal um, care, um, a wide variety of things. So substance abuse, mental health, et cetera. Um, I, we are actually in the process um, of planning an open house <clears throat> sort of meet and greet thing. COVID precautions in place, of course. And like you said, I, I would like to echo, hopefully the, the, um, the um, vaccine is gonna help us kind of acclimate and get back to a, a normal, normal <laughs> situation for all of us. I mean, we miss live music, we miss flying in the planes, we miss face-to-face -face counseling. We didn't get into this to sit and look at a computer all the time in this field. So, um, but we're starting, I'm starting a group um, right now. It's specific to women. Um, it's very um, minimal cost twice a month. Um, and it's, it could be addiction, codependency, um, anxiety, depression, trauma history, um, food, weight, and body image, life dissatisfaction, empty nest, any, any, and any and all of those things. Um, but it's about helping women learn to trust one another and not mom shame and not, um, you know, turn on one another, but, but rather to turn to one another. And um, that's hopefully going to start in March, but the open house will be in February. So. Okay, great. Uh, and Bill, quickly just tell people how to get in touch with Parents Helping Parents for more support or more information. Yeah, you can go, as I said, you can go to parentshelpingparents.info to the website um, you know, I don't know the, the phone number off the top of my head, but you, you may, Derek, you know, I will also tell people that I, um, I, in addition to the partnership, um, work, volunteer work that I have done, I embarked on a program, uh, actually it's a little over two years ago with the Balm Institute, B-A-L-M Institute, that's based in Houston, Texas. If you, if you search for the Balm under Family Recovery Programs, it's a wonderful program that offers, um, offers a lot of services for people who, you know, are caught up in what we're talking about tonight. But I'm, I'm very close to getting my certification. I just have to turn in some paperwork. But I've already started coaching, and I, and I'm, and people can reach me if they'd like to reach out to me at discoveringhopecoaching at gmail.com discoveringhopecoaching at gmail.com and I'd be happy to to talk to you uh, all right great um thank you guys so much um follow us on Facebook if anybody just wants to visit with me or go have coffee you can find me on Facebook at therapy with Derek man you guys were just great tonight Thank you so much, um, Amy, for joining us, for sharing your expertise, for sharing part of your story. Bill, thank you for continuing to um, do what you do, um, even though you don't have to, um, and, and being vulnerable with your story and with everything and just with who you are. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. It was All very right. good to meet you, Bill. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, All I'll, right. I'll talk to you. I'll call you. Yes, yes, please do.
Absolutely. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, we will see you uh, the first Monday in February here in a few weeks for another live stream. Uh, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Everybody have a great week. Peace out. Bye-bye.